the sensory organ we use the most while exploring architecture are our eyes. But if we shift perspective a little bit and approach the same with our sense of sound, what are we likely to discover? In this episode of Building Blocks of Bharat, we are going to explore how buildings sound, not how they look. Our travels today will take us to the stone caves of Elora, the musical pillars of the temples at Hampi, the astonishing Golconda Fort in Hyderabad, and the magical hall in the Bada Imam Bada in Lucknow. Get your headphones ready as we see how developed the science of acoustics was in ancient India. We are in Hyderabad, the newfound capital of the state of Telangana. We escape the busy streets of the city and approach Golconda Fort, which is like a little kingdom in itself. Golconda, as the sign just inside the main gate of the fort informs us, is derived from the Telugu Golla Konda, which means Shepherd's Hill. Considered one of the largest forts in the Deccan Plateau, it stands on a 122 meter high hill with three lines of massive fortification. It has eight imposing gateways and it's buttressed with 87 bastions rising to a height of 15 to 18 meters. Each of these bastions were surmounted by cannons, rendering the fort almost impregnable. The fort dates back to the 13th century. It was originally controlled by the Kakatiya dynasty. This township was once famous through the medieval world for its diamond trade, as attested to by travelers like Marco Polo. Some brilliant gems like Kohinoor and the Darya e Noor were excavated from the mines around Golconda. But enough of history. Let's start our exploration with a clap. Wondering why? When you clap inside the grand portico under the dome, it can be heard in Bala Hisar Pavilion, more than a kilometer away on top of a mountain. This worked as a signaling device. The various structures in the fort are so placed as to transmit sound to different points. And so, this could be used to convey a message to the guards posted on the roof of Darbar Hall regarding the visiting dignitaries. Codes were used. One clap for a friend. Two for a foe. In which case, the gates along the outer walls would be shut at once. Three for an honored guest, and so on. Before we explore the acoustics that powered this feat, let us understand what sound is and how it travels. Sound is made by vibrating an object. So when a drumstick hits a drum, the flexible skin of the drum vibrates up and down. The skin's vibration makes a sound by moving the air above it. When the skin moves up, the air above it is compressed and when the skin moves down, the air moves with it and expands. 
the compressing and expanding of the air produces differences in air pressure. The pressure differences in the air move away from the drum surface like ripples in a pond, creating a sound wave. This is how the drum produces a sound that we can hear. And because sound travels like a wave, it will undergo certain behaviors when it encounters an obstacle. Possible behaviors include reflection off the obstacle, diffraction around the obstacle, and transmission accompanied by refraction into the obstacle or new medium. Reflection of sound waves off surfaces can lead to two phenomena, an echo or a reverberation. But before we head there, let us study how echoes work. Say, you're standing at the edge of a canyon. Hello! And you shout. When you shout, you produce a sound wave that travels across the canyon. The rock face on the opposite side of the canyon deflects the air pressure energy of the sound wave so that it begins moving in the opposite direction, heading back to you. If the canyon wall is roughly more than 17 meters away from where you are standing, then the sound wave will take more than 0.1 seconds to reflect and return to you. Since the perception of a sound usually endures in the memory for only 0.1 seconds, there'll be a small time delay between the perception of the original sound and the perception of the reflected sound. Thus we call the perception of the reflected sound wave an echo. Let us look at in a graph the blue wave signifies original sound and on the bottom of the graph we show time delay taken by sound to reach you. This is usually in milliseconds. Hello? 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 Now in an echo the reflection of original sound is separated by larger delay times. In this case the reflection of sound is in yellow color. A reverberation Hello? is quite different than an echo. A reverberation is perceived when the reflected sound wave reaches your ear in less than 0.1 second after the original sound wave. Since the original sound wave is still held in memory, Hello? there's no time delay between Hello? the perception of the reflected sound wave and Hello? the original sound wave. Hello? In this graph, we see that the reflected sound is reaching us with smaller delays the two sound waves, that is the original waves and the reflected waves, tend to combine as one very prolonged sound wave, which is reverberation. Hello. Back to Golconda. With this understanding of sound, let us see how the building must have been engineered. The fort was completed under the supervision of architects, most of whom hailed from Isfahan in Iran. They used material known for their sound reflection properties, like clay pots and pans, and blended them into the building material. The next thing they used was compression and amplification. The clapping portico in Golconda Fort has on one side a series of arches of diminishing sizes. The arches are key to the stunning acoustics that could help an army commander listen to what the sentry was doing. So, a sound wave generated under the dome of the portico would get compressed and then bounce back amplified enough to reach a distance of more than a kilometer. The fort has two other examples of interesting acoustics. One is the execution hall 
which stands below a high balcony. It was from here that the Sultan is believed to have sat and passed judgment. If a criminal was found guilty and ordered to be executed, the order would be carried out right under the high vaulted roof of the hall at a particular spot which amplified the sound of the stabbing and the last gasp of the criminal for all, especially the Sultan, a good 30 feet or so away to Shah. Makaba had good acoustics. The other interesting feature is the Hall of Whispers. This room was used by the royal ladies to entertain guests. The Sultan was able to listen in on private conversations because the walls were designed to amplify sound. Again, no respect for privacy, but a good sense of sound design. The idea of the Hall of Whispers triggers the next leg of our journey. With this background, let us continue on our journey that brings us to the legendary city of Nawabs, Lucknow. We drive through the fascinating streets of this city, arriving finally at the enormous Bara Imambara. A bit about the Imambara first. The complex dates back to the year 1784 AD and was founded by the then Nawab of Awad, Asafuddullah. It is said, hired two groups of workers. One would build during the day, the other would dismantle during the night, thus increasing the scope of work. Completed in 1891, the Bara Imambara remains standing to this day and is the pride of Lucknow. The Bara Imambara reflects an amalgamation of Rajput and Mughal architectures with strong Gothic influences. The Imambara complex comprises of a great hall situated at the end of an impressive courtyard. The courtyard is reached through two magnificent triple arched gateways and is approximately 49.4 meters in length and 16.2 meters in width. The largest hall in Asia, without any external support of wood, iron or stone beams, the hall has a ceiling that is more than 15 meters high. The roof of the hall is said to be 4.8 meters thick, with a weight of nearly 20,000 tons. People marvel at this roof, which has been built without girders or beams to uphold it. The same roof covers three halls in all the Persian Hall, the China Hall, and the Indian Hall. The Persian Hall is the central hall and is quite large in size. The China Hall is of an interesting shape, being square at ground level, octagonal at mid-height, and 16-sided at the top. The India Hall is in the shape of a watermelon, and this is the hall that interests us. The acoustics here are such that one can hear the sound that the strike of a matchstick makes across the length of the hall. Next on our agenda, the amazing dome-shaped mausoleum in Bijapur, Karnataka, known as the Gold Gumbas, which quite aptly means circular dome. And quite a dome it is. While some historians believe that this is the second largest dome in the world, others deem it to be the biggest in Asia. The dome is flanked by four tall minarets. These have a series of steps which open out into a circular balcony known as Whispering Gallery. Here, even the softest sound can be heard on the other side of the mausoleum due to the acoustics of the space. If you clap, it echoes over 10 times. It is believed that the Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah and his queen 
used to get their musicians to play in the West Pudding Gallery so that the sound produced could reach every corner of the hall. So how does this work? It is the large circumference of the gallery and the dome that makes this work. A bit like the Baraya Mambara we just saw, the sound waves hit the dome and the ceiling and reflect off the curved surfaces, coming to a focus at one or more locations in the room. Therefore, if you stand in the right place, you can overhear a very faint conversation, even if it is seven to nine meters away. The somewhat complicated physics of this phenomenon was first unraveled by the great British physicist Rod Raleigh in the context of a similar phenomenon noticed in London's famous St. Paul's Cathedral. Next on our agenda, a quick stop at the stone caves of Elora in Maharashtra. These basalt caves dug out of the vertical face of the Charanandri Hills were built between 5th and the 10th centuries BCE. There are a mix of Buddhist, Brahmanical and Jain cave temples and monasteries in this site. Our focus today is the Buddhist caves. These caves were mainly monasteries with tiny rooms, stone beds and meditation rooms. Some are more elaborate with art depicting the life of Buddha and his previous incarnations, Bodhisattva and Saints. This is cave number 10. It is a chaitya or prayer hall. The stone on the ceiling is carved to look like a wooden beam. And in the center is the stupa with a huge statue of Buddha. The cave also has wonderful acoustics. If we chant, the sound resonates throughout the hall. Which is why it must have been used as a music gallery. The shape of the cave, as well as the ribbed ceiling, help in these acoustic effects. Our final stop takes us alongside the waters of the Tungabhadra in the state of Karnataka. The temples of Hampi considered one of the most stunning architectural sites in the country. At the epicenter of the many attractions at Hampi is the Vithal Temple. The temple was originally built in the 15th century CE. The Vital Temple stands in a large rectangular enclosure which measures 164 meters by 94.5 meters. As you enter, the first impression is the meticulous geometric precision of the layout of the various structures within. The two key structures in this complex are a stunning stone chariot and an impressive pillared hall. The stone chariot that stands in the courtyard is the temple's showpiece and represents Vishnu's vehicle with an image of Garud within. Its wheels were once capable of turning. This has now become the symbol of Karnataka tourism. We cross the stone chariot and arrive at a series of steps flanked by elephant balustrades that leads to the Mahamandap or the Great Hall. The Mahamandap stands on an ornate platform decorated with based reliefs of traders, animals and floral motifs. There are five halls within this Mahamandap corresponding to the four cardinal directions and a central hall which is open to sky.
The highlight of the Mahamandap is its richly carved giant monolithic pillars. The outermost of the pillars are called the musical pillars. There are 56 in all. These slender and short pilasters carved out of the giant pillars and they emit musical tones when tapped. Originally, they were believed to produce the sounds of 81 musical instruments, but many of them don't work anymore. The pillars produce different sounds when tapped at the top, middle like a bell, and bottom. Curiously enough, they are solid, not hollow. Each of these pillars is 3.6 meters high and carved with figures of musicians, musical instruments, and dancers. Forty are lined up to form an aisle. The remaining 16 form a rectangular court in the center. The pillars are made of solid granite. Many of the pillars are composite, with each individual pillar made up of many smaller and slender pillars. The British wanted to check the reason behind this wonder, and so they cut two pillars to check if there was anything inside the pillars that was producing the sound. They found nothing. Even today, we can see those pillars cut by the British. Let us try and understand how these pillars produce musical notes. The pillars are solid, so the sound produced is because of vibrations. Sound comes from many sources. The human voice produces sound. Animals produce sound. Musical instruments produce many different sounds in many different ways. There are three categories of musical instruments, percussion, string, and wind. Some instruments need to be struck by an object in order to produce a sound. These are called percussion instruments like a drum or a xylophone. When a bar of a xylophone is struck, a sound is produced. Each bar of a xylophone produces a different note when struck, which is a principle similar to the pillars in Humpy. The pillars do not need to be hammered. All it needs is a gentle tap. This gives us an insight into the amazing material engineering skills of the Dravidian people. Clearly, the science of sound was well advanced early in India. It is fascinating to see how such ancient structures had such high technology and science. Keep watching Building Blocks of Bharat to explore more of the science that powered so much of the stunning architecture in our country.